Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my lecture, my name is Wanching Zhu from Center for Rock Instability and Seismicity Research at Northeastern University, China. My topic is Rock Damage and Failure Under Dynamic Disturbance. This online lecture is hosted by ISRM Commission on Deep Mining. About me, I got my PhD degree in mining engineering at Northeastern University, China in 2001, and I was promoted to full professor in 2006. Since year 2000, I worked in Hong Kong, Australia and Germany for more than four years and gave lectures and presentations at many universities throughout Australia, Germany, Korea, Switzerland, UK and South Africa. In 2013 I was granted the China Youth Science and Technology Award. In 2015, I was awarded the National Science Foundation for Distinguished Young Scholars of China and was entitled as Changjiang Scholar Chair Professor by Ministry of Education of China. I am an active member of International Society of Rock Mechanics, ISRM, and the executive member of Chinese Society of Rock Mechanics and Engineering, CSRME. I am also an associate editor of International Journal of Rock Mechanics and Mining Sciences published by Elsevier, and member of Editorial Committee of Chinese Journal of Rock Mechanics and Engineering. This is outline. The first is background for the study on the rock damage and failure at Krizer in the past 20 years, during which I grew up from a PhD student to chair professor of rock mechanics and mining engineering at Northeastern University, China. The first is background. In 1995, Krizer, Center for Rock Instability and Seismicity Research, is established at NEU by Professor Chun and Tang, my PhD supervisor, where the rock damage and failure is the focus. In 1998, I joined Krizer as a PhD student, programming RFPA, Rock Failure Process Analysis, based on the FEM according to principle of damage mechanics. During 2001 to 2002, I worked at Hong Kong Polytechnic University as a research assistant, studying the rock damage and failure under dynamic loading. During 2002 to 2004, I formulated and published the constitutive law of RFPA based on elastic damage mechanics in Chinese Journal of Rock Mechanics and Engineering. During 2004 to 2006, I worked with Professor Jishan Liu at University of Western Australia as a postdoc fellow, focusing the coal damage under coupled THM conditions. During 2006 to 2007, I was awarded as Alexandra von Humboldt Research Fellow, working with Professor Otto Bruns at Ruhr University Bochum, Germany, investigating rock damage and failure under coupled hydromechanical conditions. From 2007 on, I led the group Krizer going on the research on rock damage and failure associated with a variety of engineering application in mining engineering and coal and gas engineering. This slide shows the rock damage problems at three aspects at multi-scale, multi-rate, and multi-physics conditions. As for multi-scale condition, the different scales for rock and rock mass should be defined, which are very important part of rock mechanics. Usually we did a lot experiments at laboratory. The difficulty is how we can relate the lab test of rock specimen with the engineering rock mass. The second aspect is for stress and strain response of rock under multiple strain rates. In this respect, the strain rate dependency of rock strength and rock damage should be studied. The third aspect is the rock damage under multi-physical conditions, which is also called the coupled THM process in rock mechanics. This slide shows the challenges for mining safety. China is rich in mineral resource however, most of metal and no metal mineral resources are under severe mining conditions, especially when the mining goes deeper. The mining experiences high risk of disasters such as rock burst, water outburst and coal and gas outburst. A rock burst can be defined as a large volume of ejected rock fragments caused by the instantaneous release of energy from highly stressed surrounding rock and deep underground openings resulting in injuries of workers or fatalities and disruption of mining activities by Cook in 1965. 
This figure show the damage and unstable failure of the rock mass after the rock burst. This slide shows the scientific issue of rock damage and failure under THM conditions. First, damage and unstable failure of rock is the intrinsic cause of mining-induced disasters. And the natural H3, high geostress, high geotemperature, and fluid pressure environment is the hotbed for mining disasters, while mining-induced disturbance is key factor to trigger the disasters. We aim to clarifying the rock damage and failure mechanism in order to find the precursor of unstable failure and to provide theoretical basis for predicting and preventing the mining-induced disasters. The second is about the rock damage and failure of rock under multiple strain rate, including the rock mechanical behavior under dynamic disturbance. This slide shows the possible mechanism for the dynamic disturbance may trigger mining-induced disasters such as rock bursts. In this respect, mining-induced disasters, such as rock bursts, may be triggered by dynamic disturbance, such as blasting wave, in particular, when rock is under high in situ stress. Based on the clarification of rock failure triggered by dynamic disturbance, it may provide one potential mechanism for predicting the time of rock burst. During the excavation of an underground opening, the surrounding rock may experience the multiple strain rate response, i.e., transient unloading due to excavation is considered as the dynamic effect, stress redistribution can be assumed as a quasi-static effect, and blasting disturbance is of sure a dynamic effect. In this respect, the multi-stage damage model that considers geostress excavation method was established in order to clarify the rock damage mechanism during the excavation. The right two figures compare the final damage zone under different unloading durations when the excavation methods of drilling and blasting and TBM are employed. In contrast with the TBM method, when drilling and blasting method is employed, the short duration of transient unloading may induce the larger extent of damage zone adjacent to the excavation perimeter. In the study of damage and failure of rock under multi-strain rate conditions, we have carried out the following research work and achieved some results. First, damage and failure of rock under combined static and dynamic loading. Second, rock blasting damage under in-situ stress, combined dynamic static loading, and the third one is the wave propagation in stressed rock. Finally, rock damage under combined rheological and dynamic loading, where the damage and failure occurs when the rock subjected to creep stress may be disturbed by dynamic impact. This slide shows the pendulum hammer-driven SHPB device for dynamic test of rock under intermediate strain rate. The incident wave excited by pendulum hammer is of a triangular shape, featuring a long rising time, and it is considered to be an ideal pulse shape for SHPB tests, achieving a constant strain rate and maintaining the force equilibrium. The figure on the left shows the time history of tensile stress sigma t at the center of the Brazilian disc test during SHPB test driven by pendulum hammer. The figure on the right shows the failure patterns observed during the laboratory tests with pendulum hammer driven SHPB apparatus. Our results show that the dynamic tensile strength is larger than static strength, 8.9 MPa, and it increases with the rising impact velocity of the pendulum hammer. This slide shows the numerical simulations on Brazilian test with pendulum hammer-driven SHPB. The figure above shows the model setup of the numerical simulation of dynamic Brazilian test. As shown in the figure below the numerical results approximate the experimental ones at the pre-peak region of the stress time curve, although it predicts the shorter duration to reach the peak stress, in this regard, the post-peak response obtained from experiments is not the real response of rock specimen. This slide shows the loading rate and strain rate dependence. The tensile failure of rock at the strain rate ranging from 10 to 100 per second could be measured. This range is generally considered as the intermediate strain rate, as defined by Kai et al. in 2007. The figure shows the rate dependency is found in the results of both experiments and numerical simulations, i.e., 
the dynamic tensile strength increases with the strain rate. The simulation results are shown in the figure, our results indicated that main fracture is not a straight line, but shown as a damaged zone located near the vertical diameter of the Brazilian disc, which separates it into two halves. And the V-shaped shear damage near the contact area between the incident and transmission bars and the rock specimen emerges, especially when the impact velocity is relatively high. The figure on the left shows three incident waveforms, wave I, wave II, and wave III, with the peak stresses higher than that are produced by pendulum hammer are input for the numerical simulations. Numerical results obtained in this paper and their comparison to the existing results are summarized by Lu et al. Our result indicated that the strain rate dependency of the dynamic tensile strength may be caused by the rock heterogeneity and the DIF's increase with material heterogeneity. Under the impact of wave I, the damage in tensile mode, shown as red color, initiates firstly at the center of the disc, and then the scattered damaged area in tensile mode is distributed mostly along the horizontal diameter. Moreover, few elements damaged in shear mode are also observed near the contact area between rock disc and bars, thus confirming that it is the high compressive stress concentration that causes the V-shaped shear damage near the contact area between the incident and transmission bars and the rock specimen. This slide shows for cases too, the damage in tensile mode, shown as red color, initiates firstly at the center of the disc, and the failure of the rock disc is because of tensile stress, indicating the valid Brazilian tests. Under the impact of wave 3, as shown in figure, although the tensile damage still initiates near the horizontal diameter, the damage in shear mode, shown as white color, accumulates in the contact area between incident bar and rock disc, which may propagate rightwards until the contact area between the rock disc and transmission bar. In this regard, the first damage in tension does not initiate at the center of the sample, and the failure of rock disc is not dominated by the tensile damage along the horizontal diameter. Therefore, the failure process under the wave 3 becomes an invalid Brazilian test for obtaining the tensile strength of rock. This slide shows the numerical simulation on one borehole blasting. In our numerical simulation, the stress wave is applied from step 1 to 100, and from step 101 on, the gas pressure is applied. When time is 10 millisecond, the crushed zone is produced around the borehole, around which, the tensile radial cracks may initiate. The crushed zone may extend and the radial cracks propagate further. After the quasi-static explosion gas pressure is applied, it may contribute a lot to the formation and propagation of the existing radial cracks. The stress wave is responsible for initiation of the crushing zone and the surrounding radial fractures, while the gas pressure further extends the fractures. The figure shows that the gas pressure plays an important role in blasting but it is also shown to be only effective after the cavity and free surface have been preconditioned by the stress wave. Further simulation results show that the geostress condition has a certain influence on the initiation and propagation of blasting crack, and this influence is related to the lateral pressure coefficient. Under the same lateral pressure, the area of blasting damage zone decreases with the increase of buried depth. As the lateral pressure coefficient increases, the horizontal geostress is larger than that in the vertical direction, which is not conducive to crack initiation and propagation, so the vertical crack is restricted effectively. In this section, we carried out a case study of gas drainage enhanced with distressing blasting in coal seam. As shown in the figure, the numerical model is established based on the field conditions at the Qingzhuang Colliery in China. The simulation domain is 10 meters long, 5 meters wide and 7 meters high, in which the coal seams are 3 meters in thickness and the working face is 3 meters high with roof of sandstone and floor of mudstone. There are two blasting boreholes with depth of 5 meters and distance of 1.4 meters that are charged and detonated, while another one is only for measurement, being called monitoring borehole. The objective of this case study is, first, 
to examine the effect of distressing blasting on deformation and damage zone distribution in coal seam. Second, to justify the performance of distressing blasting and enhancing gas drainage. This slide shows the numerical results of gas pressure around monitoring borehole before and after blasting. This indicates that the gas drainage is much enhanced by the distressing blasting. High pressure air blasting, HPAB, is a technique first used in coal mining to fragmentize coal by high pressure air, which can also be used in distress blasting for gas drainage enhancement. The figure on the right shows an intact block before blasting. This slide shows the experimental setup for high pressure air blasting on concrete specimen. Through air compressor and booster pump, the air atmosphere is compressed to a maximum pressure of 100 MPa and then stored in high pressure gas holder. The uniaxial compressive strength of the concrete samples is about 20 MPa. High pressure air of 40 MPa is used in the experiments. Through a switch and pipe, the high pressure gas holder is connected to the blasting cartridge which has been inserted into the hole. One type of high strength gypsum is used for sealing the hole. As soon as the switch is turned on, the high pressure air is sharply released and it flows into the hole to fragmentize the concrete block. During the experiment, the particle vibration accelerations at the outer boundary of the sample are monitored. This slide shows the failure pattern of specimen after blasting. After rearrangement of the fragments, we finally found the blasting-induced cracks distribution is shown in figure A to E. A crushed zone is created around the borehole, expanding diameter of the borehole and five to six primary radial cracks are produced. Compared to the hydraulic fracturing with water, the high-pressure air blasting induces more fractures, implying that it would be of great benefit to enhance gas drainage in coal seam. This figure shows numerical model setup for high-pressure air blasting on concrete specimen. In our numerical simulation, the loading induced by air blasting is assumed as two consecutive stages dynamic stress wave due to rapid rising of gas pressure which causes the crushed zone and cracks around the hole and quasi-static loading because of gas penetration leading to the extension of the crushed zone and formed cracks. This slide shows the two consecutive stages of high-pressure air blasting. In the first stage, Gaussian wave with peak pressure of 40 MPa and duration of 400 millisecond are input into an elastodynamic finite element model for back analysis. Then air pressure applied at the quasi-static loading stage for high-pressure air blasting in the numerical simulation. It is seen from the damage zone or Young's modulus distribution at step 100 that the high-pressure air blasting induced cracks distribution compares well with the experimental observation. Thus, it is reasonable to conclude that the proposed model is effective in capturing the damage process and cracks evolution during high-pressure air blasting. The permeability distribution is shown in Figure 3, where white indicates the damaged element with high permeability. It is seen that the permeability at damage zone, no matter tensile damage or shear damage, increases dramatically. In this respect, the air can squeeze into the cracks depending not only on the permeability enhancement, but also on the connectivity between damage zones. From the major principle stress distribution, we can see that the air can squeeze into the connected cracks and cause tensile stress concentration at the crack tips, resulting in the extension of existing cracks which in turn provides new flow channels for the air flow. In this way, the air squeezes into the cracks and the cracks expands further, leading to the formation of the five primary radial cracks and the final failure of the sample. This slide shows the numerical simulations of quasi-static gas fracturing. The numerical specimen is of 50 mm in diameter, with a 10 mm diameter hole at the center. The rock is assumed to be heterogeneous with its Young's modulus and strength specified according to a Weibel distribution with the parameters as listed in table. This slide shows the numerical simulation results of fracturing with different fluids. 
Two fractures are induced by hydraulic fracturing, while three fractures for gas fracturing. We can see that numerical simulations compares well with the experimental observation. Cracks distribution caused by gas fracturing is more complicated. In this slide, the impacts of different fracturing fluids on fracturing initiation pressure, breakdown pressure, and damage zone area are numerically examined. The initiation pressure and breakdown pressure are nitrogen, carbon dioxide, methane and helium in descending order, respectively, indicating that a low viscosity fluid like helium can lead to a lower breakdown pressure. Also, the damage zone area of helium fracturing is significantly smaller than that of fracturing by other fracturing fluids. In addition, using carbon dioxide and nitrogen as the fracturing fluid, multiple irregular cracks are induced more easily than methane and helium. The fracture surface morphology induced by gas fracturing, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, is more rough and complex than that by methane and helium fracturing. The fracture initiation pressure increases slightly, and the breakdown pressure increases greatly. This can be explained by that the fluids with lower dynamic viscosity can flow farther under the same injection pressure. This numerical result is also supported by the experimental results by Ishida and Garagash. Simulation results from gas fracturing in three different rock types suggest that, first, gas fracturing in coal exhibits the lowest breakdown pressure, followed by shale, and then sandstone. In addition, the order of the area of the failure zone is that coal is greater than shale and greater than sandstone. Second, gas fracturing in coal tends to induce the widest and most complex propagation cracks, with many branches and the most significant local damage, followed by shale and then sandstone. This slide shows the validation of hydrofracturing in composite coal reservoir. The numerical specimen is of 200 mm in thickness, with a 6 mm diameter hole in the sandstone. The constant gas flow rate is 2 times 10 to the negative 5 square meter per per second. The cracks distribution predicted by the numerical simulation compares favorably with the experimental observation. Thus, the proposed model is effective in capturing the damage process in composite coal reservoir. In this section, numerical simulation of gas fracturing in coal seems sandwiched by rock layers was carried. The geometries and loading conditions for rock specimen are shown in the figure. The size of the numerical model is 5 meters by 5 meters, with a 6 millimeter diameter hole at the center of the model, and two rock layers are established on both sides of the hole. And the material properties of rock are assigned according to table. From the simulation results, we can see that rock layer has obvious barrier effect on fracturing pressure wedging. When the crack encounters the rock layer, the principal stress forms a stress concentration on the contact surface between the coal seam and the rock layer. From the damage zone, when the damage extends to the rock layer, it will pass through the rock layer and continue to propagate, and the whole fracturing process of gas fracturing is mainly induced by tensile damage. The permeability distribution shows that the interface between coal seam and rock layer will form an area with increased permeability. The above figure shows the evolution of damage zone during fracturing under different thickness of rock layer. Fracturing may penetrate the rock layer if its thickness are 0.1 and 0.2 meter. The thicker rock layer can block the propagation of fractures, therefore the gas fracturing is not so effective. The numerical simulation under the lateral pressure coefficients of lambda equals 0.2, lambda equals 0.5, lambda equals 1, lambda equals 2, lambda equals 5 are given, respectively. As the lateral pressure coefficient increases, the horizontal geostress is larger than the vertical direction, the horizontal fractures are easily induced. Compared to the hydraulic fracturing and gas fracturing, high-pressure air blasting is easier to penetrate hard rock layers and produce more complex cracks, so it can more effectively enhance the coal seam.
This slide shows the mechanical properties of supercritical carbon dioxide. Supercritical carbon dioxide behaves as a supercritical fluid above its critical temperature and critical pressure, it fills the pore like a gas, but with a density like that of a liquid. It not only has the advantage of liquid characteristic of large solubility, but also the property of gas of high mobility. The figure display the evolving fracture patterns induced by supercritical carbon dioxide, liquid carbon dioxide, and water respectively. Comparing the fracture patterns induced by the three kinds of fluids, those induced by supercritical carbon dioxide are the most complex, followed by those induced by liquid carbon dioxide and then water. These results show that the fracture are mainly initiated along the direction of major principal stress. This slide shows an apparatus used to the rock creep damage disturbed by dynamic disturbance. The apparatus consists of three key components, A, creep loading component, B, dynamic disturbance component, and C, data acquisition and recording component. Diagram of the apparatus is shown on the right. Prior to performing creep experiments, quasi-static tests at a strain rate of 1 times 10 to the negative 5 per second were conducted to obtain the stress, strain curves of the sandstone. A representative stress, strain curve is shown at the left figure. Stress waves generated by the hammer falling from heights of 300, 400 and 500 mm are shown at the right figure, where the peak stress and the loading rate are indicated. As shown in this figure, the first dynamic disturbance was performed after 12 hours and the remaining dynamic disturbances were performed at every 12 hours until the specimen failed. Strain jumps occurs after each impact, then followed by stable creep, which is comparable with the in-situ observation. The accelerating creep occurs after the third impact in this experiment. The strain and strain rates during the creep impact experiments of rock specimens with different impact energies are shown in this slide. The time to failure shortened from 37.26 hours to 33.68 hours, and to 28.20 hours as the impact energy increased from 14.7 joule to 19.6 joule and to 24.5 joule, respectively. Affected by the first dynamic disturbance, all of the axial strain curves showed a sudden increase, a primary decelerating phase, and a steady state phase. The AE behaviors during the creep impact experiments with different impact energies are shown in this figure. Affected by the first dynamic disturbance, both the cumulative AE energy and AE hit rate consisted of a primary phase and a steady state phase. Unlike the result with the impact energy of 14.7 Joule, both the cumulative AE energy under the impact energies of 19.6 Joule and 24.5 Joule showed trimodal behavior affected by the second dynamic disturbance which is consistent with the behavior of the strain curve as shown in the last figure. All of the AE energy rates exhibited an increase with the increasing count of dynamic disturbances. This slide shows the failure patterns of rock specimens after the creep impact experiments with different creep stresses and impact energies. In general, the specimen is considerably more fragmented under the higher creep stress and the larger impact energy. All of the final failure patterns looked similar to a shear dominant mode, and the creep stress and impact energy had little effect on the final failure pattern. This slide shows the constitutive law of rock creep damage affected by dynamic disturbance. In this section, two stage damage model was established. Constitutive law of steady creep is shown at the left and the elastic damage constitutive law of rock under uniaxial stress condition is shown at the right. This slide shows the experimental and numerical results of multi-stage creep damage. First, the numerically simulated creep curves are in good agreement with the experimental ones. Second, more damage occurs with the increase of time and stress levels. The fracture pattern is similar to experimental results of the multi-stage, unconfined creep tests, thus validating the proposed numerical model. The third is engineering application of the rock damage model. 
This slide shows the general idea of engineering applications. Through the integration of microseismic monitoring technology and high-performance computing technology, the microfracturing is predicted by the analysis of the background stress and damage process. A new method for the early warning of rock engineering disaster, based on the combination of simulation and monitoring, is established. This slide shows the stability analysis of isolation pillar during transition from open pit to underground mining at Sharingu Iron Mine, China. The objective is, first, open pit with a slope height of 100 meter. This pit is transferred to underground mining, where the stability of insulation pillar is very important. Second, this pillar is monitored and numerically analyzed in order to find the water inrush channel. To adequately represent jointed rock mass in computational models, Shapemetry X3D was used for acquisition of exposured rock mass surface. The 3D geologic data, including joint density, dip angle, trace length and spacing, were acquired. As shown on the left figure, a conversion was performed between the 3D joint parameters to the 2D pseudo parameters. A discrete fracture network, DFN, model was then generated using the Monte Carlo method based on the statistical joint parameters. Eleven jointed models were sampled from the generated model, as shown on the right figure. This slide shows in situ microseismic monitoring at Sharingu Iron Mine. IMS monitoring system was installed in 2006 with the goal of monitoring stress, analyzing failure progress and locating damage zones in the rock mass. 22 MS sensors were installed in the system, forming a sensor array along the strike of the mine to cover the whole pit bottom. Taking into account the effects of joints and water, a numerical model was established to model the damage evolution of the open pit bottom at the Sharingo Iron Mine. The figure on the right shows the strategy of the rock mass property modification. The moment tensor inversion, MTI, method was used to derive the mechanical properties of failure rock. Please refer the paper of Joe et al. for the details. This slide shows the prediction of rock mass stability and water inrush based on the in-situ monitoring and numerical simulation. Based on numerical simulation, the mining-induced rock mass damage is quantified according to the in-situ microseismicity data, based on which, the rock mass stability is evaluated and predicted, the channel of water inrush from open pit to underground stops is found. This slide shows the time sequence of microseismic precursors and potential rock mass stability at Sharingo Iron Mine. First, main frequency significant increase, which indicates the risk of high stability, then, B value decreases and energy increases, which indicates the risk of general stability, and then, both apparent stress and magnitude increase, which indicates the low stability, and then, medium energy events linked up, which indicates the poor stability, last, high energy events appear at damage area which indicates the precursor of disasters. This slide shows the stability analysis of main shaft at Xinjiang Gold Mine, China. First, the 11 hashtag or body within 100 meter of the main shaft is designated as a safety pillar and is designed not suitable for mining at this stage. It includes the levels negative 405 meter to negative 330 meter and the ore body at level negative 530 meter to negative 477 meter in the lower part of the shaft. Second, at negative 383 meter level, microseismic monitoring equipment is installed around the shaft. A total of six sensors were installed nearby the shaft and stope. Preliminary conclusions from December 30, 2016 to July 15, 2017. After blasting other noise events were identified and eliminated, 110 microseismic events were monitored. 64 microseismic events are concentrated at the levels negative 420 meters to negative 380 meters, which occur at the periphery of the stope and are far from the shaft. The other 22 microseismic events are concentrated nearby the new water chamber, the connecting roadway, 
and the electric chamber at level negative 383 meters. The maximum displacement 0.53 mm in the protection range of shaft is found through the analysis of microseismic data, which is in good agreement with the displacement monitored with the field sliding micrometer. This indicates that the shaft is stable. In order to carry out the stability analysis of main shaft at Xinqing Gold Mine, a three-dimensional numerical model was established with FLAC3D, as shown in the figure. The overall size of the model is 1,200,000 meters by 1,200,000 meters by 1,200,000 meters. The boundary conditions of in-situ stress and blasting-induced dynamic disturbance were applied. The numerical results show that, during the progress of mining, the damage area is mainly concentrated near the gulf and the range is small when there is no pillar around the shaft the maximum displacement of the shaft is 5.8 millimeters when a 100 meters diameter pillar is left around the shaft the maximum displacement of the shaft is 3.6 millimeters and the deformation under both conditions is less than the maximum safe displacement of the shaft i.e 10 millimeters this compared favorably with the in-situ displacement measured with TRIVEC of SOLEXPERTS. However, the stability of the shaft is ensured when the diameter of 100 meters pillar is left around the shaft. The last one is summary of this lecture. First, the study on rock damage and failure under dynamic disturbance is important for us to clarify the mechanism associated with the minining-induced disasters. Second, the failure mechanism of rock under combined static and dynamic loading during SHPB tests is clarified based on the numerical simulations. Then, the blasting damage and its application for enhancing gas drainage is numerically simulated. Finally, engineering application for the effect of rock creep and blasting on the rock. Damage and deformation is numerically studied. Finally, great thanks to my research group, and thank you for your adonations.